All right, welcome to our fourth lab this semester here for the 12-12 lab at North Georgia. Uh, this week's lab is going to be looking at something called Beer's Law, which is probably something that's new for everyone uh, in the lab. This isn't something we normally cover in the lecture portion of the class. Uh, it's something that's really, really more experimental as far as like where it's actually going to show up. It's always going to show up in a laboratory type setting when we're talking about it. Uh, and what Beer's Law is really going to focus on is giving us a way to measure concentrations in solutions. So there's a lot of different ways to go about measuring concentrations experimentally for like unknown solutions. Uh, one of the most common ones is doing like acid-base titrations, which is something we'll be taking a look at pretty extensively both in the lecture and in the lab later this semester. Uh, but this week's lab in Beer's Law actually focuses not on doing titrations, but really actually just using visual color of solutions uh, to determine concentration. Now, this isn't always going to be useful because not all solutions are colored. In fact, most solutions, when you're looking at them, uh, that you've probably dealt with over the course of your time in general chemistry probably haven't been colored. Uh, and so it's not always really a good option for us to use Beer's Law to try and determine the concentration of something because it's going to work best for things that are fairly colored uh, because those are the types of solutions that we're going to be able to use this uh, experimental method a lot more accurately on uh, when we start talking about what we call absorbance really of light. Uh, and so uh, this whole method really revolves around the fact that the intensity of color of a particular solution is it actually going to be directly related to the concentration of that solution itself. And so looking at kind of how, how we're going to actually use all this uh, and kind of trying to make sense of it, our starting point here is actually going to be to talk a little bit about why things just have color in general. Because uh, again, this isn't something that's really covered all that much in the lecture. Uh, and it's something that it, it is important probably to kind of know these things or at least useful or at least in, I think interesting to just kind of have a lot of this information, understand how these interactions work. But really color for any material or solution or anything of that sort always comes from an interaction with light. Uh, and what's going to happen is light can either be absorbed or reflected from that material or in the case of our solutions that we're going to be looking at this week can also be transmitted and passed through the solutions. And so in terms of the colors that we're going to visually see, we usually see or perceive something to have the color of light that gets reflected or transmitted through that particular substance or solution. So for instance, here we have an, an image, we see like a, a leaf appear to be green. That's because that leaf basically reflects all of the green light and absorbs light of other different wavelengths. Uh, and if we want to get a little bit more specific about it, usually the colors that we visually see are the complementary colors of the light that's really uh, kind of mostly absorbed by that particular substance or solution. So if something's appearing green, like in this image, that means the complementary color of green, based on kind of just a, a general color wheel, uh, is going to be red. So it's probably absorbing most of the light in the red region. Uh, and we have ways experimentally to actually measure where things are absorbing, as far as like what wavelengths of light they're absorbing, that we can correlate them to a, a color that's being absorbed. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of kind of neat things we can do with this type of information. So for instance, this week's lab, what we're going to be using is going to be something called crystal violet, which like its name kind of suggests has kind of a purple color to it. And if it looks purple to us visually, that means the color that it's really absorbing is probably going to be somewhere in the yellow range. And so what we're going to do is we actually have instruments that are able to detect what wavelengths of light something is absorbing. And we should hopefully see that crystal violet absorbs best somewhere in kind of this yellow region of the spectrum. And that's actually one of the first parts of this week's experiment we'll do is we'll take crystal violet and we'll basically look over the whole visible spectrum. Where does crystal violet absorb best? And hopefully, ideally, if it's appearing purple, we should see its maximum what we call lambda max or the place where it has its maximum absorbance somewhere down here in kind of this yellow region somewhere around like 590 nanometers or so. <clears throat> now in terms of relating kind of this color information to concentration and kind of how we're going to go about doing that is experimentally what we're able to really focus on and really measure uh, is really the intensity of light that we start with that we're trying to pass through a solution and then also the intensity that comes through and does pass through the solution. And so knowing those two pieces, let us calculate what we call a transmittance, which is just the actual ratio of the light that makes it through the solution versus the light that we shined on it to begin with. And from the transmittance, now we can get kind of information on something else that we call absorbance, which is very similar. And while transmittance is kind of really what we find experimentally, absorbance is what we typically use for calculations. Uh, and so absorbance, since we use it for calculations and where, how it's related to transmittance, they're kind of somewhat opposites of each other. Transmittance is really looking at how much light makes it through something. Absorbance is really looking more at how much light got absorbed by that solution or that material. Uh, and so the way we calculate absorbance uh, is actually the negative log of the transmittance itself. 
So we do have a kind of a logarithmic relationship here, but they are because it's a negative log. Like as transmittance gets higher, that means more light's able to pass through your solution. That's because it absorbed less, so your absorbance is going to be lower as far as how those things are, are related to one another. Now, <clears throat> the reason we care more about absorbance than transmittance is in terms of relating this whole idea of kind of colors and things that we see in color intensity to concentrations, it's absorbance that really matters to be able to do that. Uh, and this is where we talk now about Beer's Law and kind of the relationships that Beer's Law kind of really defines or talks about. Uh, and the fact that absorbance and concentration are directly related to one another, and they're directly related to one another by this equation that we see here, or what we call the, uh, the Beer-Lambert equation. And so this equation, kind of the pieces that you're going to see here, we have the absorbance, which we just mentioned a second ago as far as how we find absorbance. But our other pieces, we have this, uh, where you're seeing kind of this uh, epsilon here. This is what we call our molar absorptivity. You might hear it called a molar attenuation coefficient. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia or things like that, but molar absorptivity is probably the more commonly used term still. Uh, and what this is, this is really just kind of an inherent property of a particular substance for how much light it really absorbs based on its concentration. Uh, and you see the units here are going to have a concentration in it. It's molarity divided by centimeters. Uh, and the reason it's divided by centimeters here is because the B in this equation is actually going to be the path length or really the, the distance the light is going through your solution. And so for us, this is really the path length is kind of the size of the cubette that we're going to be putting in our instruments that the light's passing through. So on that previous slide, if I back up for just a second or a couple slides ago, uh, this little image right here that just looks like this little kind of rectangular thing that has what looks like liquid in it, that's pretty common shape of a cubette. It's got kind of that rectangular prism shape. Uh, and so the light that's going through here, this distance across the cubette is typically always one centimeter for all the cubettes that we use. And that's pretty standard, not just here, but pretty much anywhere. Cubettes are typically that size, mainly because for Beer's Law, then when we actually go to use it, which is one of the if we're doing Beer's Law, we're almost always using cubettes of that kind of stat, uh, status. And so it's just convenient for us to have a path length of one centimeter. That's what we'll see for our cubettes this week. And then the last part of this equation, C, is just going to be the concentration of our solution, which means absorbance and concentration. They're linearly related to one another. Uh, and the only part here that's really kind of going to change is the molar absorptivity, but the molar absorptivity is always going to be the same for a particular compound. So if you know the molar absorptivity of that compound, you can actually just find the concentration if you know the absorbance, uh, if you just do a quick experiment. That's actually something that's very easy and very quick to measure. Uh, the tricky part is often knowing what this molar absorptivity is, but thankfully we can actually do a quick calibration curve and find that ourselves without a whole lot of effort, then, then lets us find the concentration for any unknown solution by just measuring absorbance. Uh, and so it's, that's kind of how, how this all eventually wraps around, kind of sees potential use. Uh, and like I said, this, this idea of using Beer's Law and using color to figure out concentration is a very commonly used technique in a lot of different aspects of chemistry. Now, the experiment we're going to be doing this week then is going to have three main parts. Uh, I mentioned that the very first part of this experiment is actually going to be looking at finding lambda max for crystal violet. Uh, and so basically we'll have a, a small cubette with some crystal violet solution in it. Uh, and what we're going to do is basically we're going to hit it with all light in the visible spectrum. And what our spectrophotometer, the instrument that we're going to be using that I have an image of in a second is going to look for is how much of each of those different wavelengths is our solution absorbing. And we're going to look for what we call this lambda max. And our lambda max is simply just what wavelength does crystal violet absorb the most at. And so uh, the lambda max then, once we find it, is going to be useful to us because in part two, what we're going to do is uh, specifically tell our instrument to look at, all right, what's the absorbance at that exact wavelength of our lambda max? So that now we can try and basically have, track our concentration as efficiently as possible. Lambda max, is since it's always going to be like the, the spot where our solution absorbs the most light, uh, then it's just going to be the most convenient thing to look at as far as as we change our concentration, how much does it actually absorb. So the second part of our experiment is going to be generating a calibration curve. Uh, and to kind of remind people what a calibration curve is from 1211, uh, that's basically just you're, we're going to be measuring kind of the absorbance at a few different concentrations and then making a linear regression line uh, for all of our data points that hopefully then gives us a way to relate, like typically based on our measurements that we've made, you know, if we know what the absorbance of something is, we can figure out what the concentration is based on our linear regression equation uh, for our line that we get from that. And I'll, I'll detail that again in a second as well. And then our third part of our experiment is going to be looking at measuring absorbance over time. Uh, and this is actually going to be a prelude to next week's lab on kinetics, because uh, kinetics is all about how concentrations change over time. And one of the really nice, cool things in this particular case is that we can do a reaction with crystal violet and sodium hydroxide, and you can actually see the color change visually over time. 
And if we measure exactly how that color is changing by the, measuring the absorbance over time, this will also give us a way then to look at how concentration changes over time for that reaction. Um, and now we have concentration versus time data that we can now apply next week to start getting some kind of kinetic information about this particular reaction. Uh, and so I think it's kind of kind of neat that we can see some very immediate applications now of Beer's law that go beyond just simply measuring concentration or finding an unknown concentration now has other applications as well. We can actually track reactions in real time, which is uh, a really handy thing to be able to do uh, when you're trying to figure out information about those reactions. <clears throat> now, for the experiment, a couple things to be aware of. Uh, crystal violet itself, it is a chemical dye, uh, which if anything that's a chemical dye, uh, probably you want to be aware of, it stains pretty much anything and everything that it comes into contact with. Uh, that includes skin, clothes, and glassware. So while you're doing the experiment, uh, it's probably advised to kind of, just kind of take some precautions. I would wear gloves. Probably wouldn't wear any clothes this week that you're particularly fond of, just on the off chance something does spill. We're not using very large volumes of these things, but it doesn't take a lot of this stuff, even at really tiny concentrations, like I said, to make a small stain on something, uh, unless you really feel like making something that's a purple tie-dye of some sort. Uh, and then for the glassware part of this, uh, we do really want you to pay attention to what glassware you're using for different parts because we actually only want the crystal violet handled in certain pieces of glassware because the crystal violet will actually even stain glass. Uh, and so it will stain and kind of coat the glass in a way that's very difficult to ever get off. Uh, and so we don't want to kind of permanently stain like all of our glassware supply that we always use for 1212. So please only use the glassware as directed to, to handle the crystal violet in. And so the only things you should ever really be putting the crystal violet in glassware wise, uh, we'll have one or two graduated cylinders set out to measure out the crystal violet volume initially from this general stock solution in the hood. Uh, only use the cylinders that are there with the crystal violet for that. Uh, and then we'll have small rectangular jars. Uh, they are kind of like rectangular in shape. They're very obvious. They're not a beaker. They're not a flask. Uh, they look like kind of almost like a rectangular jar. Uh, that's where you're going to actually hold your crystal violet solution uh, and where you're going to dilute your original solution into the main sol uh, solution concentration we'll use for most parts of the experiment. Uh, and then also for the second part of our experiment, we're making our calibration curve. We are going to be doing some dilutions of your uh, crystal violet solution. And for those, all the mixing to make your different uh, concentrations by doing dilutions, you're going to do in the little 10 milliliter beakers. Uh, and so those 10 mil beakers, the rectangular jars, and the kind of just one or two designated graduated cylinders, those are the only pieces of glassware that should ever be exposed to the crystal violet. Um, and that way we can kind of just segregate those from the general glassware supply that everyone else uses. Uh, so we're not going to stain glassware for other classes or other labs. And we will eventually use cuvettes to make our measurements. And so the cuvettes aren't as big of a deal. We have lots of those. Uh, and actually, they don't tend to stain as bad as the glassware from what we've seen with them so far. Uh, and so if the, if the cuvettes actually are still very clean and don't look like they've picked up any kind of purplish or pinkish tints to them uh, after you've used them, uh, you can rinse those out. And we can actually reuse those for other lab sections. And so we like to kind of keep reusing the cuvettes as well, along with all the other pieces of glass we want to reuse for each section. So when you're done with everything at the end of the lab, and I'll kind of highlight this again later, make sure everything kind of gets back to its starting place in the hood so that we can reuse the, all that same stuff for the next section. And then the last part that will go with this too, crystal violet, and I'll, I'll highlight this again at the end of this video too, uh, none of it can go down the sink. Like I said, it stains literally everything, uh, and so we do need to collect it into the waste uh, and so we can get it, disposed of, uh, get it disposed of properly. Now, the instrumentation we're going to be using, we're going to be using something called a spectrophotometer, uh, which sounds a lot more complicated than it is, uh, although they are pretty fancy devices in terms of what they're able to do. Uh, you're basically going to take light of either all wavelengths or even a specific wavelength if you tell it to and shine it through your solution. And that, that device is also capable of detecting what light of the different wavelengths is passing through the solution and what at what intensities. Uh, and so these are what we're actually gonna use to make all of our measurements for this lab. Uh, the lab procedure actually has some really nice step-by-step -step instructions that I, I don't think is kind of worth the time of me going through them all again here. Uh, but do look at that lab procedure for the actual step-by-step -step inst instructions for kind of using the lab quest to set up and calibrate and run the different parts of the experiment for you. Uh, because they, the lab quests, I mean, everyone's familiar with using these things before. They, they can be problematic at times, but I, th I think we have hopefully some pretty good instructions here for this lab uh, as far as kind of what to do step-by-step -step to get everything running properly. Uh, if you do have any problems, uh, please ask your TAs, ask your instructors to help as well. Uh, and if there's any really big problems you find as far as kind of the step-by-step -step instructions, feel free to blame Dr. Meyer for, for not writing them all enough.
Uh, but the biggest thing for these instruments when you actually go to use them, uh, we're going to be putting our solution in those little kind of tiny plastic cuvettes to make our measurements in. And for those plastic cuvettes, when you look at them, you're going to notice there's uh, kind of like two clear sides that are opposite of each other and two kind of like ridged sides. You need to make sure that the two clear sides on your cuvette when you put it into the instrument, like what's shown here, the two clear sides need to be on the sides that have kind of this arrow basically pointing through uh, that little hole that we put the cuvette into. Uh, if it's not set up that way, your experiment is not going to work properly and you're going to get some really strange kind of absorbance values uh, because what's happening is like the, the light needs to be able to pass straight through the actual cuvette itself and it's only going to pass through the clear sides properly. If you put it with the ridges, kind of the way this thing is imaged, if the ridges are pointing to the left and to the right, then the light's not going to pass through the glass properly, and we're going to get some really strange absorbance values. It's going to kind of refract and bend in some weird ways that uh, we don't want it to. So make sure when you go to put your cuvettes in, clear sides need to be to the left and the right if you're facing it the way that this kind of image is showing your kind of entire setup with the spectrophotometer. Uh, and then the ridges will be pointing kind of up and down the way this image is organized. Uh, like I said, if you don't do it that way, that's kind of the only way you're going to get some really strange measurements for some of the parts of this experiment. Uh, and then the actual measurements themselves are, are actually pretty easy to make because once you get these things calibrated, you are basically just take the cuvette out, rinse out, put the new solution in, put it back in, get a brand new reading, and move on, especially for like that, that calibration curve portion uh, where we have a few different solutions that we're going to be trying to measure the absorbance of. <clears throat> now, I said I was going to mention a little bit more on calibration curves again. So the calibration curve in particular that you're going to make uh, from the data you collect in the second part of this week's experiment uh, is that you're going to be plotting absorbance versus concentration where you put absorbance on the y-axis, concentration on the x. Uh, and for that second part of the experiment, you're basically going to be measuring the absorbance of, I think it's like five different concentrations of crystal violet. Uh, and so now we have five data points that we can use here to make our calibration curve. Uh, and hopefully what we should see is if you plot those five data points, they should pretty much all be along a straight line. And you can make now a linear regression line that lets you find molar absorptivity uh, if we want to know that exact value. And also lets us help, uh, gives us a way now that if we want to, we can use Beer's Law to actually calculate concentration, right? So this, uh, this equation for Beer's Law, if we know our molar absorptivity, the path length is always just one centimeter. Uh, if we measure the absorbance, now we know the concentration of something. That's kind of the goal we want to work towards. Now, finding the molar absorptivity itself is actually pretty easy because once you've made your calibration curve with your data and you've got your linear regression line, the slope of your linear regression line should actually just be the molar absorptivity. Because if you're plotting absorbance on the y-axis, concentration on the x, absorbance over concentration, if B is 1, we're moving to these two pieces over, absorbance over concentration, if B is 1, is just the molar absorptivity. Uh, and so you can actually see it and find it very quickly from our calibration curve if we've done it correctly. <clears throat> and again, like I said, our, our end goal here and kind of the, the eventual application goal then of this is that once we know the molar absorptivity, now we can find the concentration of a solution based just on its absorbance. And so the last little bit here, uh, just kind of waste, waste collection and cleanup reminders for this lab. Uh, everything you use in this lab, uh, make sure you're kind of carefully disposing of it. Uh, all of the waste is you're kind of doing your different dilutions and kind of making your different measurements for your different solution concentrations during the experiment. Uh, as you kind of get ready to switch from like one uh, concentration to another, put all the waste in the, uh, like the, the smaller beakers that are on like at each bench that are labeled to collect the, this crystal violet waste. Uh, and then at the end of the lab, or if that beaker happens to get close to full, uh, just go ahead and take that larger beaker then towards the end and go ahead and empty it into the actual waste container in the hood. Now, this will just hopefully keep people from having to move around too much constantly and like go pour out little cuvettes in the, the waste container in the hood constantly and there, it just creates a lot of foot traffic that way. Uh, so we want those smaller beakers set up on each of the bench tops for people to kind of collect their waste as they're doing the experiment. Uh, that will hopefully just make things run a little bit smoother and a little bit easier for everybody. And then, again, the one last thing here I can't really emphasize enough also, uh, since crystal violet does stain glassware, please make sure to only use the glassware we direct you to for the crystal violet. So that's those kind of, like I said, almost like rectangular looking jars uh, that you're going to hold your main solution in for the crystal violet. Uh, the graduate cylinders that are next to the crystal violet are showing me one or two of them there uh, to actually measure it out to begin with. And then also the very small 10 milliliter beakers uh, that you're going to be making your kind of mixtures in for your different diluted concentrations for the second part of the lab. Uh, other than that, your crystal violet shouldn't be going into any other glassware except the actual waste containers that we'll have labeled out for you. Uh, and I think that pretty much wraps up everything for this week's lab. Uh, as I said, this is a brand new lab for us this semester. So if you do see, like if you have a kind of feedback or comments based on anything that's in the written portion of the lab, uh, or as you've done the experiment itself, please feel free to pass those along. 
Uh, let us know things we can add or improve uh, with this experiment. Hopefully it's uh, at least a colorful, kind of interesting one, but one's a little bit different from kind of some of the things we've been doing so far this semester.